I'm Carolyn De La Pena. I'm the Interim Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education, and it's my pleasure to introduce our Chancellor, who will introduce the Chancellor, speaker, <laughs> uh, and yes, Chancellor and President. Uh, and uh, I will give you just a few words to, to start us out. So uh, Linda Katehi has been our Chancellor here at UC Davis since 2009. Uh, she holds faculty appointments in electrical and computer engineering and women and gender studies. She's a member of many amazing organizations, and the list could go on and on. A couple of them, I will tell you, is the National Academy of Engineering. She was the chair until 2010 of the President's Committee for the National Medal of Science and the Secretary of Commerce's Committee for the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. She's also the fellow a fellow for the American Association of the Advancement of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And it's great to have Linda introduce Nancy because Linda has also been a, a real advocate for increasing undergraduate students' access to research and to full participation in, in the life of the university and beyond. Please join us, Linda. Well, thank you very much, Carolyn, for uh, your very um, nice introduction. I was hoping to uh, have it a little shorter than that. But, um, no, they gave me a really long I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that uh, for a, um, you will not see the chancellor uh, many times introducing in a forum that is organized under the provost um, uh, seminar series. But this is a very special occasion, and I was very pleased, in fact, when I was invited to present our speaker. I will uh, say a few things about uh, Nancy Cantor, but before I go there, I just wanted to thank, of course, our provost, Ralph Hexter, and uh, Professor Jonathan London for their great work and their staff as well for putting this wonderful series in place. I know there has been a long uh, series of uh, many other uh, seminars, and um, I'm very pleased to see that we've had the opportunity through great speakers to really uh, talk about important issues in relation to the public institution, public university, and its mission, and of course, the, uh, our connection with the community and the role of the community in the progress we make as an institution. Of course, um, the last always, I would say, for as long as I have been in higher education and uh, most recently, there has been a great debate uh, nationally and internationally nowadays about the university. Of course, in the U.S., the public university is uh, what we most of the time discuss, uh, the mission of the public university, the challenges that we face, the expectations that uh, the public has, and, of course, our challenges in observing our mission, doing the best we can to deliver on the uh, promises that we've made to the public and at the same time protect the excellence of uh, the work our faculty, students, and staff uh, perform on our campuses and, of course, the quality of the education we provide to our students. Um, but I would like to say that uh, today I'm very pleased to introduce Nancy. Um, I've known Nancy for a long time, and I will say a few things that are not written here because um, I just wanted to say that um, I met Nancy when I was at the University of Michigan, and Nancy, in fact, came back to Michigan as the dean of the graduate school. And I took a very short period of time for Nancy, really, to uh, make an impact um, on the campus and for all of us to pay attention to the things she was doing as the dean of the graduate school, and quickly after that as the provost. As a matter of fact, I was in the search committee, as a member of the search committee, that identified Nancy as the provost. And I have to tell you that I was totally impressed by the things that Nancy said about the university then. So um, her thoughts about, the, about higher education, of obviously the public university, um, the, the mission of the public institution, the connection and responsibility towards the community, those were thoughts that Nancy had since many, many years. And um, I've made a point to make sure that I connected with her. And it has been um, since then that 
I've followed her and her career and we have been connected for many years and I have truly appreciated and really um, respected the work that Nancy has done as a leader in, in many universities and most recently as the Chancellor and President at Syracuse University. So um, I, I do not want to go over her many recognitions and memberships in many academies, but I would like to say that the impact that her work has really made, not just uh, in Syracuse at the university, but also in higher education across the board, um, and the impact her work and, and her success has made on many of us, female leaders in higher education, is even bigger. So I wanted to thank you, Nancy, and please come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. It's just wonderful to be here and, and you know, really a joy to be introduced by someone I have such respect for and know, have known for so long. We were, we were little ones in the, in the vineyard together um, at Michigan, battling all the things one battles. Um, and it's great to be here as part of Ralph's um, series, which I think is, is just so terrific. So I really am honored to be a part of this year-long series of focused on the university and the social good. Um, as we all know, higher education is under the magnifying glass today for a host of reasons, ranging from the state of our economy and the escalating stakes riding on a college degree to our need as a diverse democracy to engage all the best talent we have. Every college and university in the country is feeling the heat of intensifying scrutiny and it says really, I think, a great deal about the character of Davis and your community that in this climate you are gutsily and, and admirably facing it frankly and directly and thinking in a frank and open and full way um, about what we want and need from universities today. And, and I really want to compliment Jonathan and the Center for Regional Development and Humanities and everybody who has come together to really um, put this on. So in the heat of this moment, it may appear that our present anxieties really just boil down to a rekindling of the decades-old conflict known as the culture wars. But if we were to zoom our lens out to the perspective of history, we would see at once that this conflict is neither new nor anomalous. The great medieval, medieval universities of Bologna and Paris and Oxford were cloistered, elite enclaves, but they were also power brokers embroiled in both the ecclesiastical and civil struggles of their day. Uh, I would urge you all to read about it. It's really um, remarkable to go back. One noted 19th century historian, for example, portrayed them, and I quote, as great public forces accustomed to political action and taking part in political agitations. We all know those, right? <laughs> At the same time, their faculties were prone to, and again, I quote, the habit of incessant argumentation <coughs> and blindly attached, this is a quote, to their narrow and restricted science, intractable, generally impervious to new ideas, hostile in consequence to all whose thoughts differed from theirs, and yet feeling obliged to consider all objections, sometimes to the point at which they scorned what seemed too clear. So today we may be uncomfortable under the magnifying glass, but perhaps that's because it's been too long since we've studied ourselves critically in the looking glass. If we try to look at academic culture from the outside in, we have to admit works. We have to admit that too often we let the trappings of our traditions, disciplinary and otherwise, get the best of us. We get too lost in minutia that ultimately are inconsequential in the world, and we lose sight of what drove us to dedicate our lives to scholarship and teaching. Few, if any of us, aspired to a life of armchair analysis. We wanted to make a difference. We understood that this would require us to push ourselves to expand what we knew, always questioning our assumptions. As unique centers of scholarship and learning, the prototypical ivory towers of the Middle Ages could, could retreat comfortably 
behind their walls when the winds of change began to blow. Today, I would argue, there's no going back. The challenges we face demand that we integrate culture and technology in ways unprecedented in size, scale, and intricacy. Our chances of success depend upon our willingness and ability in to engage with others in word and deed, and to do so genuinely and deliberately in both local and global arenas. So located here in what, what has been called the Silicon Valley of food, you are ideally situated to address the most important challenges of our day, including safe and abundant food supplies on a planet where climate change is making deadly and seemingly inexorable progress. You know all too well the scope and complexity of our need for sustainability and what deliberate thought it will take, especially as it links to so many facets of human life. There's a substantial risk, for example, that great areas of our nation and many others will no longer be able to produce food using the resources and technology we have in hand. Even now, this is a hungry world where millions of people could be called climate refugees. Fully aware of these dangers, the journal Nature editorialized last year, and I quote, that climate scientists must be even more energetic in taking their message to citizens. Indeed, the challenge is urgent and the editors meant well. But as Harry Boyd and John Spencer later observed, climate change and other critical issues are well beyond the capacities of science to provide crisp solutions delivered via one-way transformation. The cult of the expert cannot ultimately prescribe effective solutions. Reality demands a different framework. And I think that's what we're here to talk about. The civic science that Boyd and Spencer suggest implies a much more seamless, and therefore likely to be contested, integration of knowledge and perspectives from citizens and scholars, a diverse community of experts, as we dub it in Syracuse, addressing together the large challenges that are anything but abstract as they unfold in our many locales. Such an integration of ideas and actions is highly likely to be contested within the academy. Collective problem solving confronts us not only with contested views about quality and purpose, but also the need to transform both how we do our work as researchers, innovators, teachers, learners, and who we work with day in and day out. And I'm not talking here about first order changes, tinkering with the way we do things to make them work better or more efficiently, but second order changes that transform the university and our orientation to scholarship, teaching, and our many interfaces with our communities and with the world we share. Indeed, higher education in this country has been similarly challenged before, expanding from its elite European origins when the moral acts of the Civil War gave rise to our great land-grant universities like this and many of our historically black colleges and universities. In the midst of a ferociously fractious time, these institutions were born to be stewards of place, to use a phrase of our time committed over generations to nurturing and building their communities as engines of opportunity, prosperity, and democracy. They were aimed simultaneously at spreading innovation through university community outreach and fostering access to education for the next generations. As they did these, these democracies colleges, as they've become known, established a fundamental compact, a fundamental social compact, with the public. So once again, we're living in what a national task force convened by the Department of Education and led by AAC&U called, calls a crucible moment in a frightening and fractured world with shrinking borders, growing disparities, polarization, and unnerving uncertainties. Our problems are complex, both globally resonant and deeply embedded in local context. They evade simple solutions. Although we can link with each other instantly on social media across time and space, our inter-ethnic and intercultural distances and conflicts 
continue to grow at lightning speed. Many of our cities have become battle zones where legacies of abandonment are evident in depleted affordable housing stock, widespread unemployment, crumbling infrastructure, and failing schools. Indeed, as we perfect pipelines of technology, grids and networks to massively share information, energy, and goods, we too often forget about our human pipelines, especially the one from cradle to prison instead of cradle to college in so many places. And as Jonathan London and Ted Bradshaw of your Center for Regional Change illustrate compellingly, our rural areas are threatened by the relentless marginalization they've suffered for decades as sites of extraction of resources to feed industrialization resources not the least of which, of course, is food itself, rather than as centers for the generation of, act, of opportunity and cultural development. In an era when the, when the information superhighway is the route to prosperity, large swaths of our countryside and many of our small towns are bereft of broadband access and left standing by the side of the road. Regardless of place, deprivation is a huge and pervasive threat to all of us. As the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Mohamed el Baradi told an audience at Syracuse this past fall, poverty is a weapon of mass destruction. This is certainly true in the US as the distribution of wealth becomes increasingly skewed towards those who already have a great deal. Ultimately, these problems are rooted in entrenched ways of thinking and doing, from overconsumption to the perpetuation of individualist myths and hyperpartisan zero sum thinking that defy collective solutions. We're urged to maximize personal advantage and see our lives in terms of what's in it for me. These habits of mind and heart are not, as we all know, easily altered. Taking them on requires changes that can only happen if we marshal the best of our knowledge and commit ourselves to collective action, global in scale, but defined by nuanced place-based movements in many locales with different landscapes, norms, and practices. In this, higher education has a central role to play, even as the pressures and demands on us have increased and our resources have been diminished. As the landmark report of the Kellogg Commission made so clear really some time ago, we must reshape our fundamental social compact with the American people to fit, as they said, the times that are emerging instead of the times that have passed. And so we find ourselves in what I have called an existential identity crisis. Who are we? What are we trying to do? How do we measure up? Where do our responsibilities lie? The ex answers begin where we are. Universities have bonds of place, and place matters. If we look critically at ourselves, we can see that all too often we really have fashioned our campuses as places apart from the world, physically as well as metaphorically. And while we like to think of ourselves as being all about plumbing the depths of the world's great challenges and finding solutions, we tend to do that we tend to do that by trying to remove ourselves as much as possible from the world. Meanwhile, we need only peer over our campus walls, through our gates, and down the hills upon which many of us sit. Syracuse sits up on a hill over. <laughs> to see that holding the world at arm's length to try to solve its problems, as if we're not a part of them, is really not worth as Wendell Berry said in his remarkable Jefferson lecture at the Kennedy Center, and I quote, for humans to have a responsible relationship to the world, they must imagine their places in it. To have a place, to live and belong in a place, to live from a place without destroying it, we must imagine it. Scholarship and engagement are changed by place. As Nick Dirtz, drawing on the Work of Clifford Geertz observed, and I quote, we should be cautious about assuming that abstract social theories are never affected by where they are read. So I think what we're talking about today is place. 
In principle, the revolution now underway in technology ought to help us place that abstract theory in context, connecting us to others with information to contribute. However, a deep reading of our world requires a commitment to listening, to speaking across difference, to reciprocity of interaction, and to rolling up our sleeves together. When we stop at connectivity alone, communication can be an illusion. It's far too easy to think that we understand the issues from the point of view of others when we, in fact, do not. This pitfall of electronic communication, in contrast, perhaps, to face-to-face -face interaction, is particularly problematic as we try to forge deep, place-based collaborations in which we must take into account multifaceted differences of opinion, experience, position, and location. As faculty and students getting an education in the world, for the world, all of us need to probe differences, not gloss over them. As partners in our communities, we need to re-engage the art of conversation. In this spirit, the Crucible Moment Report calls for, and I quote, hands-on, face-to-face, active engagement in the midst of differing perspectives about how to address common problems that affect the well-being of our nation and the world. We actually have great capacities for this kind of public problem solving. As my colleague from Syracuse and co-director of Imagining America, Scott Peters, has no doubt pointed out in this lecture series last month. Yet as he always reminds us, fulfilling this promise requires moving from a model of public service where students and faculty do things for a passive and needy public to one of public work that taps and engages and develops the civic agency, talents, and capacities of everyone inside and outside the academy. We need to move deliberately and assertively from what we might call extension services, epitomized by a slogan to one unnamed university has in their airport that says, and I quote a big sign that says, community problems, university solutions. <laughs> to a reciprocal and engaged approach in which we are part of, not distanced from, the issues at stake. And this move is typically not without its contested politics. We witnessed this recently, at, well, a million times at Syracuse, but we <laughs> witnessed this recently at Syracuse when a department decided to move its home base off campus including its mental health clinics and classrooms for training graduate students. And a leading faculty member marched into my office and said, I'm leaving the university. This move was not in my career trajectory. Other faculty members have called the move a win-win. To facilitate the move, the university renovated this amazing 107-year-old building in downtown Syracuse into a beautiful high-tech space where the department will collaborate with neighboring St. Joseph's Hospital to educate its graduate students while simultaneously addressing the tsunami of unmet need for mental health services in our older industrial inner city. They plan to offer eight to 10,000 visits a year, but just as importantly, they plan to engage directly in the broader collaborative work of so many residents, academics, business people, nonprofits, and public agencies to rebuild prosperity and opportunity in this long abandoned, wildly under-resourced neighborhood. But partnerships like these require models that are far more inclusive and trusting than our customary ones. We must reach out broadly to bring to the table a fulsome community of experts seasoned in life's experiences, whether or not they have the standard pedigrees. In the process, if we're to create an ecosystem of innovation, we must do much more than tell others what to do. Lasting and successful collaborations require creative information sharing, problem solving by diverse groups in real time, embedded in situ where real life unfolds. To do this, we have to be willing to change many of our most entrenched habits of mind and the ways in which we normally approach problem solving. That is, as experts, 
often solitary geniuses with some graduate student disciples, telling others what to do. As PIs working on a grant cycle, here one day and gone the next. As innovators protecting IP. As disciplinary advocates guarding the silos. As neighbors living cheek by jowl with our communities rather than as participants embedded within our communities. As leaders rather than partners. All of this needs to change for us to be effective, trusted, sustained catalyzers of real social change. And no one should expect that to come easily or without contestation. So let me now take a bit of a tour through Syracuse. And when I think back on how, how so much of our currently publicly engaged work at Syracuse began, it all hinged on a decision nine years ago to do a listening tour, both on campus and as importantly, in the city. Under the rubric, University as Public Good, Exploring the Soul of Syracuse, we dedicated the year 2004 and to five to engaging in dialogues with many stakeholders to envision the university's course for the future. We started from the assumption that even a private institution has a public mission. Our life as a place-based anchor institution was, is, and always will be inextricably intertwined with that of the city we call home. During our year-long exercise in listening, we heard expansive appreciation for the university's achievements and the positive impact of its mere presence in the community. But we also heard expressions of profound disappointment that so many of our past engagements had been one-off, one-way projects of little or no long-term impact for the community, and that we tended to view our surroundings as being full of problems to be solved, rather than partners to be engaged, talent to be tapped, and assets to be developed. And that was really one of the most profound experiences I've ever had, to spend a year in churches and neighborhood buildings blown out buildings, and we go in there and all we can see are the problems. And what's really there is incredible talent and assets and aspirations. And I remember a grandmother saying to me, you, you've got this fancy communication school up there. Why, why is it okay that every newspaper story about Syracuse, about our neighborhoods, is about crime and about the things we're doing wrong. Look at those billboards. They're all so negative. You, you want your children to wake up in the morning and go down the street and see a negative statement about them every day? Why don't you come down here and we'll tell you the stories. And we do. We now have the South Side newspaper and the Near West Side newspaper. And they're full of the most uplifting stories. Sounds cliche, sounds simple. But changing that focus, Ken was talking about it this morning. I mean, changing that focus is everything. So this listening exercise heightened our other senses. Soon, everywhere we looked around us, we began to see not problems, but potential. Nowhere has this been truer than our city's near west side, and I'm going to zero in on that work. It was once a hotbed of industrial innovation. It gave the world the first air-cooled automobile engineers, significant advancements in air conditioning, some of the first typewriters, specially hardened steel plows for farming, and innovative gears for machinery of all kinds. The list goes on and on. It was a major source of salt and solar evaporated salt. But this thriving district was hit hard during the city's long industrial decline after the Second World War. Today, the Near West Side includes the ninth poorest census tract in the nation. Half of its residents live below the poverty level, 40% are unemployed, 17% consider themselves to have one or more disabilities. Home ownership has shrunk to 15%. It is like so many inner city neighborhoods, 
a majority minority community with 44% African Americans, 23% Latino, Latina residents, and multiple generations who faced the harsh disparities of growing up on the other side of our country's racial divide. Still, as we listened to the voices of the Near West Side and came to see it with new eyes, we began to sense very clearly that this neighborhood was brimming with opportunity. All you have to do is ask Mary Alice Smothers, the fabulous grandmother in the middle there, ask us, she says. We lay our heads down here at night. Ask us what needs to happen. It's a place tightly knitted together by neighbors' shared belief in themselves and hope for the future, by churches like St. Lucie's and its revered pastor, Father Jim Matthews, by community groups like Peace Inc., one of the region's oldest nonprofits, and La Liga, the Spanish Action League, and by bonds of affection as well as accountability, exemplified by wise grandmothers like Mary Alice, who know not only everybody in the neighborhood, but what they've been up to. To tap into this wellspring of talent, instead of telling them what to do or giving out expertise or resources, we did something we hadn't done before very often in the institution. We partnered with all of these constituencies, as well as local corporations, regional nonprofits, and the city of Syracuse to form the Near West Side Initiative. The Salt District, we called it, as reckoning back to its history. An independent 501c3 organization to set an agenda together for our collective action. We spurred the, the 501c3 with $13.8 million, which Syracuse was dutifully paying back to Albany um, on a science building, a loan we were paying back on a science building, and I convinced a legislator to give us that 13.8 instead of it going back to Albany. And that became the seed fund of the 501c3 near West Side initiative. So the initiative agreed that lasting changes would require leveraging both our social and our civil infrastructure. And this has been very much at the base of this initiative. Our collective gaze fell immediately upon the array of empty, blown out warehouses and ugly railroad trestles that effectively walled off the neighborhood from the rest of the city, both physically and metaphorically. So the Berlin Wall, as the neighbors dubbed it, really cuts off the near west side from the thriving Armory Square restaurant, bar, cultural district of downtown Syracuse. And this, it turns out, is true, as I lecture on this um, throughout the country, it turns out it's true in older industrial cities and rural cities all around this country, that you'll have a thriving, gentrified, cultural district, the creative capital district, and then you'll have, essentially, the Berlin Wall and behind it, this kind of neighborhood. So di to dismantle this divide, the initiative began to tap the talents of residents, local leaders, Syracuse faculty and students across the full range of disciplines, pooling public, private, and nonprofit resources, and transforming that wall into a bridge linking the neighborhood's assets, the university, and the world. For example, from a tumble-down warehouse occupied by pigeons and other urban critters, the initiative has created a LEED Platinum certified multi-use neighborhood hub that's home for artists who both live and work there and have grown up there, as well as headquarters of our district-wide collaborative school reform partnership, Say Yes to Education Syracuse, and La Casita, a Latino-Latina cultural center created by SU faculty members and La Liga. Another massive and formally imposing section of the Berlin Wall has become the home of Pro-Literacy International, the world's largest literacy organization, and the regional public broadcasting station, WCNY. 
As the once abandoned warehouses can come alive with new tenants and neighborhood meeting places, the Berlin Wall now announces the stories of resilience and energy through graffiti artist Steve Powers, and I quote, love letter to Syracuse. Steve came and he spent a summer, nearly a summer, interviewing residents and painted all of the trestles, and this is just one example. And newly designed energy efficient houses are replacing vacant lots while run down abandoned housing stocks being renovated and sold to longtime residents, sometimes for only a dollar, as nonprofit home headquarters partners with the Near West Side Initiative to ensure that everyone can stay here. The initiative is committed to forestalling any massive gentrification. And in addition to the 103 lots purchased by home headquarters, with 23 of 40 converted homes so far sold to longtime residents, another nonprofit, Christopher Communities, has constructed 60 affordable rental properties. The cranes hadn't been seen in this neighborhood for 40 years. And it's an amazing event to watch, to just go down there and watch as residents pour out as cranes come in and now spell a renewed future of hope. Poetically signified, really, by Steve's trestle, adorned trestles on the Berlin Wall. Spring comes and summer waits. And perhaps in Davis, that doesn't have the kind of meaning it does in Syracuse. But you do have to know that there's a lot more snow like that. And the hope for the future is that spring will indeed come and summer will be right behind. So all of this might sound like magic. And if you were to visit the Near West Side today after having been away for a decade, as many people are, you might actually think, there is some kind of hocus pocus going on. But in fact, it's very real. As Syracuse-born architect Rob Collins, who now lives and practices in Berkeley, blogged recently after a visit back home, including a trip to the near west side with his father, who'd grown up there, as Collins writes, and I quote, in a dirt poor Irish Catholic household of 12 kids. On this day, Collins goes on to say, his father's old neighborhood not seen for 30 years by his father, who still lives in the area, was unrecognizable to him. The area had been to war and back, sort of. It was re-emerging with new housing being built near downtown for the first time in decades, block by block. Through the eyes of both an architect and a hometown boy, Collins captures the gritty miracle that's emerging in this place, and I emphasize gritty. He writes, and I quote, the solidity of these great buildings, be they churches, towers, or factories, have served Syracuse for multiple generations. Despite all the change, they're still here because they're substantial, built to last. They're accommodating new uses, lives, dreams, as well as the continuity of the old. So two generations, Collins and his father, can share a moment. He goes on to say, the walk gave me great hope for my hometown. It all takes a lot more courage and conviction, he says, in Syracuse than it does in San Francisco. And, while I real is, and, and what I realize is how much this city and the experiences within it have shaped me and inspired me. In reality, of course, th these gains are the product of more than courage. A lot of very hard work, including contestation, off and on campus. Collaborations in the community can be loud and messy, as the Near West Side Initiative board meetings are sometimes, as members bring their divergent backgrounds and perspectives to the table. But this kind of managed conflict is both natural and necessary. It's also a sign that our constituents believe that what they say as individuals and what we do collectively really matters. That excitement is shared by increasing numbers of faculty members eager to take on grand challenges with a local face. They're finding that they can tackle the global research agendas of their disciplines locally while providing extraordinary immersion experiences for their students. All concerned can see for themselves that the world's problems do not present themselves within the neat 
confines of a single discipline. Faculty members and students in architecture, communications design, Latino, Latino, Latin American studies, education, information studies, public health, civil engineering, journalism, visual and performing arts, and I could go on and on, have all been involved here in efforts that are out of the box. By way of illustration, art education professor Marion Wilson teaches her students to think outside of all the boxes by conceiving of the medium of their work as social sculpture. She and her students transformed a former crack house in the heart of the neighborhood at 601 Tully Street into a thriving hub of creativity. Its mission is to provide the space and connections with neighborhood as a catalyst for creating new work. Just down the street, Wilson helped spark a collaboration between Paul Nojame, owner, third generation owner of the supermarket, and St. Joe's Hospital, which had announced that it would establish a community health and nutrition center adjacent to Paul's Market. Now they're collaborating on a new project to blend public art with a campaign for nutrition, which is a vitally, as you can imagine, largely unmet need in this neighborhood. They've commissioned Tat Futan, an incredible New York artist deeply involved with ecological sustainability, to create a public sculpture on the outside of the supermarket to encourage passerbys and shoppers to think about healthy food. It will feature the artist's hat. What he has is this nature matching system, a, ma a multitude of swatches in which each shade of color represents a fruit or a vegetable. So eggplant, deep purple, you get the point. So the artist came to Syracuse last spring as an artist in residence at 601 Tully and is now working with the supermarket, the hospital, and a local architect on plans for the installation. Tan will also visit Seymour Elementary School just across the street. Everything intersects in this kind of work, where Wilson students will work with two teachers to write an art and nutrition curriculum. Her students will also work with students and teachers at the school to create a mural like Tan's. Eventually, we'd like to see them all over the city at 601 Tully and other sites as icons of art nutrition. So the schools in this community embody the nation's biggest challenge, to transform urban schools in poverty-stricken neighborhoods like the near west side from failure factors and factories into intellectual elevators that enable all groups to participate fully in our nation's prosperity. Lodgett School, pictured here, across the street from 601 Tully, so across the street from what used to be a crack house, is the neighborhood's grandest structure, but it's been physically battered. It became notorious in Syracuse for youth violence and has been labeled, like almost all of our city schools, as persistently low achieving. And yet, near West Side residents' hopes and aspirations for the school remain so strong that when the school district, in its eminent wisdom, threatened to take it off of a list of schools slated for renovation, the neighborhood rose up as one. And when the university added its voice to the chorus, I would say it was the turning point in our gaining credibility with residents, who saw that we too saw ourselves as being in the neighborhood for the long haul, willing to risk considerable political capital since the mayor was dead set against this renovation. To stand with. Today, Blodgett School is part of Say Yes Syracuse, an urban school reform experiment that's taking place on a scale not seen before, at least in our Rust Belt city. And the process has been both messy and magnificent. SU is collaborating with the Syracuse Teachers Association, the city, the county, the American Institutes for Research in this effort, which is led by the Syracuse City School District and the Say Yes to Education Foundation. So Say Yes emphasizes the persistent and all too well documented achievement gap. But we emphasize in this that that achievement gap between urban and suburban kids is actually an opportunity or access gap. Say Yes provides crucial comprehensive support for the district's 21,000 students, addressing academic, 
but even more importantly, social, emotional health and legal barriers that so often are absolutely insurmountable for inner city youth. So we have health clinics in all the schools now, legal pro bono legal clinics for families of people who have kids in, in the city district, things like that that are really critical. As importantly, of course, there's the financial barriers to higher education. So we created a Say Yes to Higher Education compact where Syracuse City School Districts receive full tuition support at any of the campuses of the State University of New York system and more than two dozen private institutions that I recruited um, to this effort. To date, the compact has supported more than 2,000 students in making the transition to college. and We've got nearly 200 at SU right now. Very clearly going to be there for the long haul if we can raise the endowment for that compact. So as my tour of Syracuse's near west side and sayest education, brief tour albeit, suggests effective social change often requires new ways of doing our best work, which while hard, really can be incredibly rewarding. In third spaces of collaboration, we can talk and listen to each other, not as winners or losers in debates that mirror the divided landscape of our polity, but in exchanges that catalyze us to join forces in creating a world where everyone can win. As Karen McTighe Musel described in the latest issue of AAC and News magazine, Diversity and Democracy, we need, and I quote, a new paradigm of generative partnerships that makes more transparent the interdependency of modern Yet as you know well, very well, this territory of interdependence is where the contested politics of knowledge enters stage left. For it exacerbates fairly or unfairly, and likely both, fears of takeovers of the academic mission by non-academic, should we say, impure outsiders, be they fears on the one hand of corporate or legislative intrusion, or on the other, of the heavy hand of ideology and politics, particularly in the voices and interest groups of demanding neighbors and community organizers. Surely the interdependence of modern life doesn't lend itself to purity on either side, as we have seen day in and day out in Syracuse, on both sides of the fence, so to speak. And in the midst of navigating modernization, Sometimes the DNA of our meticulously argumentative medieval forebearers surfaces as it did conspicuously when we began to systematize our efforts to create these generative partnerships in Syracuse. So for example, one of many, a committee of our university senate conducted what turned out to be first a two-year study of the foundations and varieties of engaged scholarship part of our vision at Syracuse of scholarship in action. The study included testimony by engaged scholars and yielded a 54-page white paper interpreting for our campus community what this kind of scholarly work is all about. Then an equally long and, thank goodness, successful process resulted in a one paragraph, maybe it's two, revisions to our faculty manual took two years of work to get this, but it is there, incorporating language that explicitly expresses support for publicly engaged scholarship in evaluations of faculty research contributions um, in the tenure and promotion process. It is there, now we have to learn how to use it, but it is there. At the same time, many of our generative partnerships continue to draw contested debate, and we all acknowledge that it's not surprising. We've had protests from some activist faculty and students over corporate intrusion, such as J.P. Morgan Chase's underwriting of a global enterprise technology partnership that spans our curriculum and research to support the bridging the di digital divide in our city schools as part of Say Yes. We've also heard from the other side, from some outspoken faculty critics of our public engagement who fear that it is turning SU into, and I quote, a community college 
noting especially the concomitant commitment to recruiting a more diverse student body as, and I quote, a worthy cause, unfortunately presumed to be at odds with competitive US news rankings. My point here, however, is not to adjudicate which critique is more worrisome, but rather to define this mixture of concerns, some radical and some traditional, as inherent vulnerabilities of the messy, impure world of publicly engaged scholarship, teaching, and social change. And while I would and do differ strenuously with the opinion that we at Syracuse, for example, are diluting in any way the quality and excellence of our scholarly productivity with this work, or the promise of future contributions from our ever more diverse student body, I also readily acknowledge that we're in somewhat uncharted territory. By virtue of our deep commitments to these broad, embedded engagements, we're certainly less fully in control of the work, have a wider array of cross-sector partners, and give voice to talent often not seen before or to which we're not accustomed on our campus. Take, for example, our considerable involvement with the massive water project to reclaim a Superfund site, Onondaga Lake, once a sacred site of the sovereign Onondaga nation on whose ancestr ancestral land SU sits. This multi-year project with extensive participation and huge import for our region involves our environmental engineers and scientists in partnerships that go well beyond the relevant federal funding agencies to include for example, the original corporate polluters, principally Honeywell with other local firms, the leadership of the Onondaga Nation, in many respects this land's first environmentalist, and the environmentally conscious county executive, thank goodness. The trust and credibility that were accorded by these many sides in this venture is built upon a foundation of intense work by faculty members ranging from social scientists with expertise in regional economic development, public finance, to public humanists and artists. And they actually are most critical, I would argue. What they share is a profound concern with issues of environmental justice. Key participants include members, of course, of our Native Studies faculty, very much bolstered by our institutional commitment to fully support the cost of attendance for any entering student from any of the six Haudenosaunee nations who qualifies for admissions to Syracuse. In other words, doing this work requires an embrace of new talent and a tolerance for divergent voices. And as such, it's not for the faint of pure hearts, even as all of our hearts are lifted to see bald eagles return to Onondaga Lake. You have no idea how exciting it was to see that happen. Now, likewise, we're all eager to see prosperity return to the whole region. I've been giving you a zeroed-in look at neighborhoods and at the lake project. But we're really trying to build from this bottom-up approach to a new approach to regional economic development. And in fact, Governor Cuomo has given us an opportunity, we hope, to do this. So I co-chair the Regional Economic Development Council for Cuomo with the local economic development organization. And we have managed two years in a row now to get the top New York State prize award. And we're doing it by investing in precisely the diverse under-resourced communities that are both rural and urban in the five-county central New York region. So we're doing it by working in just the ways we work in the near west side, but trying to explode that across the region. Getting support for transformative initiatives like broadband in rural regions, like the kind of reconstruction of the Berlin Wall in the near west side, Embedding arts and technology and culture throughout everything we do because it's an enormous asset, easily built upon, 
in both rural and urban communities in this area. And our social and civil infrastructure of collaboration, precisely those bonds of trust that are beginning to form there, really, I would argue, are the major factors in our region's success in the last two years. Say yes to education is very much at the heart of this, because if there isn't a future for those kids, there isn't going to be a future for the region. But we do that by embedding it authentically in a broader sense of empowerment within the neighborhoods and within the counties and the communities. And I do believe that there's renewed hope in a region where falling fortunes since the 1950s have bred the most stubborn pessimism you could ever imagine. It is actually giving way to a few positive headlines in the local paper. Only a few. But it is giving way to some optimism. So let me end with both my own defensive pessimism and some optimism about the work that remains to be done within our universities if we are to be full or at least fuller partners in our regions and beyond. For while we often construe the work of publicly engaged scholarship, teaching, and learning to be prin principally in and of the world, that is, in those third spaces of fervent interaction beyond our campus and our disciplinary boundaries, all of us have a great deal to transform inside our boundaries as well. And I want to end focusing on that. This is surely the case if we're to embrace and produce the next diverse generation of leaders and citizens and scholars. This requires institutional citizenship, an eloquent phase, phrase coined by the legal scholar Susan Sturm, with whom we work and with Imagining America on a project linking diversity and public problem solving. As that project says, and I quote, we must assert an affirmative value focused on creating institutions that enable people, whatever their identity, background, or institutional position, to thrive, realize their capacities, engage meaningfully in institutional life, and contribute to the flourishing of others. If we're to continue to fuel the imagination of the next generation, it will be more important than ever that they see what good we do in and with their own communities, near and far from our campuses. We should redouble our efforts to widen the breadth of educational access. We should figure out how to be a welcoming place of opportunity, both for international students who plan to return home and for immigrant populations bringing their rich talents to our country. We must strengthen the pathways to our institutions from community colleges, where so many first-generation students start out. And we should make every effort to bolster the STEM pipeline for all of them. As we bring this wonderfully diverse talent to campus, we must also attend to the vibrant educational and scholarly environments in which we can listen across difference and energize each other as students, as faculty, and as citizens of the larger community. And I often say to people that if we could create on Syracuse's campus the vibrancy of the interaction, as messy and contested as it is, that occurs around the board table of the Near West Sign Initiative, I would feel like we were successful. So at Syracuse, I funded a collaborative team of scholars from the humanities, social sciences, education, and law to come together and think about how we would create just academic spaces, as they call them, in a project called Democratizing now Knowledge. So they seek to create these just academic spaces with all the double meaning of both spaces of social justice and spaces of learning rolled into one in the normal course of academic life. This involves, it's actually incredibly hard, reimagining and expanding their and our intellectual and political boundaries to intertwine knowing, being, and doing. 
They're drawing upon the intellectual commitments they share in the sociopolitical landscape in which they and we live, one that includes finally on equal footing the histories and experiences of underrepresented communities. This perspective intersects at many points with the concerted work of the eminent social psychologist Pat Gurn and her colleagues who are creating structured intergroup dialogues across campuses across this country. Syracuse is deeply involved in this project, defined, and I quote, as a form of democratic engagement that fosters communication, critical reflection, and collaborative action across cultural and social divides. And that's quoting from Gretchen Lopez, a faculty member of ours and director of our intergroup dialogue program. So the intergroup dialogue program offers academic courses that cross disciplines and engage students across familiar divides of race, ethnicity, sexuality, and gender, airing differences and vulnerabilities to build common ground. It's also an incredibly productive, structured curriculum to give us a way in to creating K-12 to, to 16 collaborations. So Gretchen, for example, is collaborating with district teachers and administrators as part of Say Yes to embed intergroup dialogue in and among high schools in Syracuse and to bring suburban and urban high schools together in a curriculum, English curriculum for 10th graders and an after-school youth participatory action research club called Spotlighting Justice. But to sustain efforts such as these and to spur genuine institutional transformation, we got to take in hand the fabric of our academic culture. For example, we must figure out, as I said earlier, how to reward publicly engaged scholarship. This is work in which many have been deeply involved, and many of you know the work that Tim Eatman and Julie Ellison did on scholarship, their, man, their manuscript scholarship in public. In addition, the pub, Imagining America's Publicly Active Graduate Education Collaborative seeks to do the same thing with a new generation of graduate students. And they are clearly getting the message. And let me quote from Janine Anderson, who blogs resolutely, I might add, on this. And she says, and I quote, far too often academicians engage community organizations with preconceived knowledge hierarchies that privilege scholarship born within the university over that which springs from the community. Mindsets that consider community-based knowledge as an addendum to scholarly work rather than something that stands alone must be changed in order to effectively integrate community-based expertise within the academy. New generations of academicians must fully embrace their dual citizenship within the academy and the community that surrounds the institution. Yet this mix of rewards and struggles for publicly active scholars and the contested territory it reflects is probably not going away soon, even as voices for engaged scholarship gain momentum. So as Joe Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist, said in his uh, 2001 um, Nobel acceptance remarks, and I quote, we as academics have the good fortune to be further protected by our academic freedom. With freedom comes responsibility, the responsibility to use that freedom to do what we can to ensure that the world of the future be one in which there's not only greater economic prosperity, but also more social justice. Can we do that? Still, many in the academy argue that there are limits to what we can or can be expected to do in this cause of prosperity and social justice. They ask if we as research universities are going too far afield to address challenges that are much too big. The viability of our K-12 schools, the sustainability of our waterways, agricultural lands, and urban brownfields, the broadband connectivity of our rural communities, and the digital divide in our inner cities, the economic development of our regions, and humanity's urgent need for peace. Perhaps this ambivalence about the scope of our purpose is natural as we seek to redefine ourselves for the times that are to come. Just as Iser 
one of many middle schoolers in Syracuse under the tutelage of SU photographer and professor Steve Mahan, is learning to use the tools of digital photography and poetry to answer fundamental questions about her identity and future. As she says, and I'll read it here because you can't, probably, nothing is simple in that identity quest, she says, quote, the meaning of my name is tricky. Sometimes I don't like my name because my brother made fun of it. My grandmother named me, but I still like it because my lovely grandmother named me. Even a name can be complicated as we shape a comfortable identity. So like all good identity quests, the questions that now confront universities are similarly vexing. There are no easy answers. The best we can do is be mindful, like she is, of where we came from. Be courageous enough to try tools that may be new to us, as she did here. And keep our eye on fulfilling our broader social compact. Then the stuff falls apart. 
person to marry a Muslim and her kids, and Steve Mayhem and his students, and our architecture faculty, and our environmental engineers, and their students, all of whom spend months and months and months on the ground, rolling up their sleeves, and not privileging their position as experts interviewing, right? So, so that's one of the big questions. It, it, it almost comes down to something as simple as schedules. You know, if, if, if you run this by the university schedule, that in and of itself is a statement about power. And, you know, I mean, I remember Jim Matthews, who's the parish priest on the west side of Sinner's Welcome yeah. Church, um, who um, got in massive trouble with the bishop in the area because I'm Jewish and he gave me communion one day. And he said, I go there often to be with the groups there. And uh, um, the bishop hauled them in and, you know, um, and then this, um, I just have to digress and tell the story because it's one of my favorite Syrian stories. So this um, Jewish woman died and left um, $500,000 to St. Louis. Now St. Louis is, is like the poorest, you know, it, it's the most inclusive, totally disability inclusive church. Um, I mean, Sinner's Welcome is true. It's, it's truly, an, it's an amazing, it's the Berrigan's church for any of you who know. Um, and Berrigan family members are still a part of the church. Um, and so she leaves this one right now. Th that same bishop came and took the money. <laughs> so they never got a cent of it. Jim always calls it the canner fund that's sitting in some bishops, whatever. But anyway, you know, I, what Jim always said to me was that, you know, doing this work can't be on our schedule. Because that means that we don't understand that they don't, that they live this every day. And it's not just that they live the problems every day. It's that they live the assets and the richness every day. And they don't believe we really will see the assets every day if all we do is come in. So, so I would say that one of the things we've been trying to figure out is how you, what's the right balance of long-term, boots on the ground, fully committed intellectual capital, and, and yet how do you make this a two-way street where it's genuinely deeply embedded in the, in the academic mission of the institution? So it can't just be people who, you know, are seconded out to the near west side. It's got to be, there's got to be a back and forth. The other um, thing that I think is really important is that you need to really embrace simultaneously the relationship between publicly engaged scholarship and a diversity agenda. And whatever you want to call it, inclusion of full participation agenda, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. That is really what the Near West Sign and all and work in many neighborhoods in Syracuse, like the Near West Side. Really what they want is that SU is a place for their kids. And we can do all we want to, you know, enliven, make prosperous, change the fate of the community. But until it, until we're a place for their kids, it's not long term and it's not real. So, yep. doing the, in our case as a private institution, it meant really understanding financial aid. But it also meant 
really empowering the voices of that next generation in the city so that people, quote, on campus would realize the incredible power and energy and potential that you don't see in a world defined by high stakes testing and narrow measures. There's no way we become a place for their kids if all that we are is a place that looks at the narrow metrics that will be rewarded by rankings and X, Y, and Z, right? I'm not, I mean, this is not a radical agenda. It's not, you know, I can't, I mean, I swear to get. <laughs> but, but the truth of the matter is, until we empower those voices, Nobody sees them as having protected. And I would say the intertwining of CS education with the work in the New York side and on the South side is what actually is at the key of what will make a difference here. Because it, it's got to be that there are different ways to see these, these kids. So that's where the arts and humanities come Because without the work, and I just showed a few examples, I mean there are millions, unbelievably powerful examples of the voice, the narrative, the, the, the vision of these kids. I mean, Steve Mahan and his kids do a, and they're from schools all over Syracuse, but we have a we had renovated an old warehouse and right across from the Berlin Wall where our design programs and architecture programs are. And, and um, we have a great gallery in there. And um, Steve and his kids do exhibits every, every semester. These are middle school through high school. Um, and I mean, they're the most powerful work, bar none, that I see. And, we make an F, we announce those shows and we get them plastered all over SU News and all this to try to get people down there to see. Because you can't look at that work and ever look at those kids again as not having potential. You just can't. You can't look at that stuff and not see the potential. So that's a long winded answer to a very complicated question. There are a million things we've done wrong, but we've learned something. We just have time for I'm more sorry, more I was too yeah. long with no, no, no. <laughs> You mentioned a number of times in your talk that the challenges and the conflicts that come up, and you used a term I think that you called managed conflict. Yeah. I wonder if you can talk a bit more about how do you um, deal with and embrace conflict in a way that is true to the different perspectives, but in a way that can move a dialogue and process forward rather than devolving into destructive yeah. processes. Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, let me give two answers to that. One is that very early on in this work, pretty much at the end of the Exploring the Soul of Syracuse work, um, I started to create a set of what I call kind of criteria for investment that were going to be criteria for when the institution would be putting full force behind an engagement. At, at, not that it wouldn't be a thousand flowers blooming, that is the, you know, all the service learning courses would continue and all the volunteer work would be done and the fraternities would, you know, go and do their charity stuff and, you know, all that stuff would go on. But what the institution was going to do had to follow the following set of criteria. Um, and it's actually exactly what um, Young Jim <coughs> said this morning. Um, the literal, I mean, so we were only going to do institutional major investment. And that isn't always financial. It's, it's often a, our ability to get grants from outside put into it. But we were only going to do institutional investment if we were working on stuff the neighborhood had identified as important. And the neighborhood might be on another lake. I mean, it's not always a specific neighborhood. 
if there were things we were good at, so that we could commit that there would be interest and expertise for the long haul. Because if it was all dependent on one faculty member and that person gets a sabbatical and they're gone, or they get recruited away and that's that, then we will have raised expectations. The third criteria was that there had to be partners, and preferably many sector partners. So there, it had to be something that nonprofits, local government, the neighborhood itself, the relevant points were equally as committed to as we were. And then it had to be something that we were willing to co-share power and partners, which is what she was saying. I mean, that is, we weren't going to invest in things that people weren't willing to give up a place of expertise and power. And that's the managed conflict. So the other answer is that with those things in mind, we tend to do things by creating third spaces. Because it's only those third spaces, and they're sometimes metaphorical, but they're sometimes very real, like in your West Side 501c3. The board, that board, is as, and maybe these are like what, um, in East St. Louis, what the requirements were. Um, that board is actually more than 50. It is wildly over-determined by local hands and voices. Um, and our, ex quote, experts, whether it's Dean of Architecture or the Vice President for Community Engagement, you know, you know they, they, they're in there battling to get a word in, but they, but they don't have full control. And, you know, we all live in a market economy, quote unquote, but the market economy, as Stiglitz always says, is geared, is rigged for us, right? <coughs> so we wanted to rig that market economy for them. And often it leads to decisions that go counter to our disciplinary expertise. That was certainly true in the environmental work we're doing on the Near West Side, because it's a deeply infrastructure for the and, and a lot of times, the decision making, because it was so locally managed, wouldn't have been the, the decision that by ourselves we might have made. Um, so when I say manage conflict, I mean really, I guess, a code, that's a code for giving up power. Um, and, you know, for academics, power is parking spaces and knowing that you're right, right? I mean, so um, there are no parking spaces down there. And we have to say that we're not right. with just uh, two uh, layers of appreciation. First, uh, just appreciating um, the, uh, the leadership and sponsorship for um, this uh, long and, and very uh, powerful day, the, the provost's um, office for, and the forums for the um, public university and the social good, the Department of Community and Regional Development and Human Ecology, our Center uh, for Regional Change, um, today's special uh, sponsorship with the Davis Humanities Institute and the California Center for Collaborative Research for an Equitable California. Um, and, um, and for all of you for, for uh, being here tonight and for those who are able to be here during the day. And uh, just a, a closing, uh, closing appreciation of, of, the, of the day. So we began this morning with uh, what can be really heard as a, a call to engage in, in productive ways in a, a politics of knowledge uh, and to really rethink, reimagine how universities are engaged in that politics of knowledge and how we can develop different kinds of partnerships with communities to 
work towards that social good. So if that was the call, the response was this incredible day um, of, uh, of a, a, a contested knowledge, a, a provocative set of questions, uh, a, an amazing set of, of models, promising practices. And that, that call and response uh, makes a lot of sense if you think about the roots of engagement, which is uh, both refers to commitment, like I'm engaged to you, um, but it's also about challenge. Engage. So commitment and challenge, commitment and challenge, it's sort of encoding of a DNA. That's what we're trying to do is to encode this DNA into the university, uh, into the university's DNA. So thank you for being part of that encoding. And uh, we have a, a reception here in the back. And so thank you to Chancellor Cantor and to, uh, to all of you. So thank you. <laughs>